Hello, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming on this webinar. This is actually the first time I've uh, done this. Can everyone kind of hear me okay? Hopefully, uh, hopefully so. Dustin, can you tell if everyone can hear me? Is it all working? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm uh, Dr. Bhavesh Patel. I uh, run the Senogenics Center here in Chicago. It's the sixth center in the country. Uh, with Senogenics. So I've been doing this for about 10 years and uh, the medicine's outstanding. I'm really excited to do this webinar. It's, again, it's sort of like a new idea and first time I've done this, but everyone who's on this call is sort of like a friends and family. So my goal here today is just to sort of introduce a bit about Senogenics and our approach to medicine and wellness. And then I'd like to open it up for questions and answers later. Uh, just because, again, it's a little bit more of a limited group and more uh, informal. You know, one of the things with Senogenics is, you know, we're focused on something called age management medicine. And back when I was younger, when I first started medicine, I did urgent care and ER and uh, sort of plain old family practice medicine. And most of that uh, medicine was focused on avoiding or, or sort of taking care of a disease after it happened and saving someone from calamity after the, you know, after the, the health was already lost. Uh, when I got to Senogenics, it was a lot more about being healthy and well for as long as possible and having vitality as we get older. Uh, as most of you know, you probably have friends who are older and healthy and well and running and, and uh, very active and other people who are probably taking a lot of medications uh, and and, uh, and are not living the life that maybe they hope to uh, in the end of their years, especially after uh, working very hard to create a good life. So the webinar I'm going to do today, this presentation, uh, I want to I want to definitely want to introduce to you a bit of what we do, some of our secret sauce, so that you know even if you're not my patient, I at least want to have uh, anyone who's on this webinar know what things they should be paying attention to so they can have that kind of vitality you know, in the later years. So that's why it's called how to take charge of, of your future well-being. So um, again, I wanna teach you about our approach to living a healthier life. And the idea is how you age is a choice. Uh, most medicine and most doctors will say, hey, you know, everything's, you know, you haven't fallen off the rails, your numbers aren't, failing, your grades aren't failing. So, you know, come back next year. And once you have a problem, we'll take care of it. But realistically, you know, uh, again, how we live our life can affect how we age. And that will have a tremendous impact on the value of life that we have uh, later. So, you know, here's a couple of pictures of what some people think about uh, as they get older. We've all seen people like that. And here's some examples of people who have a lot of vitality. So the idea here is to have the kind of life as we're older to reap the benefits of all the work that we've done ahead of our time. So again, it's about upgrading our expectations. What does it mean to age? What is the expected wellness and longevity instead of absence of disease? So I'm gonna talk a bit about the wellness mindset versus the disease mindset. I want to explain a bit about normal values in terms of health versus optimal values. And then last but not least, I'm gonna explain some of the key levers that we use at Cytogenics that help us get great results with our patients and some of the stuff we can do today. So what you'll learn, why regular medicine isn't helping you be your best, how you should be thinking about your health, what your biochemical group, uh, blueprint, and by that I mean your labs are telling you what steps you can take to change the course of your life. And again, the key pillars that we use at Synergetics, I'll uh, reveal those. So anyone who's looking for an alternative to what mainstream, is off mainstream medicine is offering, people who want to stay uh, healthy at the top of their game. One thing we're really good at is complex medical issues that um, uh, many uh, traditional medicine uh, doctors uh, fail to address. So that is something that gets covered in Xenogenics. Uh, when I say that, I mean things like stress, fatigue, autoimmune issues, and, and, and a number of things that 
regular doctors just kind of say it's part of normal aging, but we know that we can do something about it. And so energy, strength, physical strength, drive, ambition, mood, all of these things improve when you take this comprehensive approach to health. So if you had to create health for the next 25 years, what would it mean financially, maritally, parentally, avocationally, vocationally? What dreams and goals do you have? Um, I was working, I was talking with a trainer who actually trained some, a, a number of uh, prominent hockey players. Uh, and he had a great point regarding the, the sort of the time and investment you spend early on and what that means later in terms of uh, financial and, and sort of health. You know, if you think about compounding interest, if you were to save $10,000 and let it compound for the next 20 or 30 years, it's worth a lot of money. Anyone can, you know, grab a calculator on Google and figure out what that's worth. But the idea is putting those chips in the bank now pays huge dividends later. If your health, or if you just live longer for another 10, 15, 20 years, the finance, you know, just even financially, it's a, it's very valuable to think about your health now. So Senna Jenks, for those of you who don't know, we've been in practice for 22, uh, maybe even 23 years now. We've got 20 centers across the US. We've got eight centers abroad. We've treated over 35,000 patients. We've trained 4,000 doctors, I think even more than that. So we've been in the space for a long time and we've sort of created this, this idea, this field of lifestyle, health and wellness. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's been really great. Uh, I'm board certified in age management medicine, which is what we're talking about today and family medicine. I'm definitely more proud of the age management medicine certification. Uh, again, I found a Chicago, uh, the Chicago practice in 2009 we're the uh, sixth center in the country. Uh, I've spoken at many conferences. Again, I have a background in traditional medicine, still very good at it. Uh, for a little while, I quit medicine uh, when I was frustrated with it, and I uh, worked as a research analyst in New York as a biotechnology uh, analyst for uh, hedge funds, uh, but that was definitely not as rewarding as medicine is. So I'm gonna go through these slides uh, sort of kind of quick, but the state of affairs in medicine. Mortality has been uh, uh, going down, life expectancy is going up, but as the mortality goes down, we're seeing a rise in things like cancer, heart disease, uh, accidents are going, you know, we don't ha we're not working in factories where we get injured as much, the accidents are going down, people wear seat belts. Most, a lot of that is actually due to increased sanitations, uh, sewers, street cleaning, garbage removal, uh, vaccination, a lot of the stuff has uh, helped a lot of the life expectancy. So it's not just medicine alone. Uh, just having clean water, having good food supply, uh, where you know we don't have famines anymore. Uh, modern agriculture has definitely been a boon for uh, calories. Now there there is some you know thought around the the nutritional value of the food that we got compared to uh, back in the old days. But regardless, you know we don't have the famines anymore. People get food. Housing's better, political stability makes a big difference. Obviously antibiotics, the introduction of penicillin, being able to fight off pneumonia and tuberculosis has been, a, you know, people are living longer with that. So what else is now? Well, it's uh, chronic medical conditions, heart disease, cancer, lung, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, uh, diabetes, and uh, kidney is actually pretty huge. So 60% of uh, Americans have some type of chronic disease and 40% have two or more chronic diseases. So it's definitely a big deal. You can see that the mortality from heart disease and cancer have risen from the 1900s. So part of this is we live longer. So we have lived, lived long enough to actually develop cancer. Uh, we have lifestyle factors that are uh, in play, poor nutrition, and when I say that, I know I said earlier that the food supply is better with agriculture, but we also have lots of sort of processed food, snack foods and uh, foods that are ready to eat and devoid of nutritional value, but easy to eat. Uh, tobacco, nutrition, physical exercise has gone down quite a bit. We don't have physical labor jobs as, as we did in the past, uh, alcohol use. Uh, although I have no problem with the end of prohibition. So the quality of the food supply is, uh, Again, what I, what I mentioned earlier with the quality of the food supply is the processed foods and some of the devitalization or, uh, of, of the nutrients in, in uh, the agriculture. Environmental factors, this is kind of a big deal. We have 85,000 uh, synthetic man-made molecules 
that uh, that we'd never got exposed to as we evolved. And those are things that our body has to process. So those are sort of like the BPAs in plastic, the polysorbate in shampoo, the um, uh, birth control pills that are flushed on the toilet, herbicides, pesticides, uh, obviously uh, air pollution from cars. So this is all stuff that our body has to deal with that we did not deal with as we evolved as uh, Homo sapiens. So all to, you know, so all together, it's just you know too much to carry. It's a lot for our body to deal with. So our genes are still playing this easy game of pong that most of us probably grew up with. I think everyone on the call can probably play this game. Very few of us can play this game, but you probably have kids who can. This is Fortnite. I have, I could never play this game, but this is kind of what we're dealing with as a as a human, sort of in a relative uh, way of saying that, meaning whereas we might have had a few environmental insults and challenges as we evolved, now we've got the environment, we've got stress, we've got a uh, lack of circadian rhythms, you know, we don't go to sleep with the sunrise, I mean, with the sunset, and we don't wake up with the sunrise, we wake up and you know, with an alarm, and we get coffee, and we go to work, and we have all the stresses that are associated with normal living. So the challenges are very different, our body has to take that and, and deal with that. So it's sort of like this guy, you know, got a, a lot of people to fight, a lot of things to try to uh, deal with, but we're going to do it. So as a recap, we're living longer, we're facing these new challenges, our bodies cannot adapt as fast as the challenges come around, at least without, not without uh, some help and supportive uh, 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 help. When the body breaks, it shows up as chronic disease, you know, sort of diabetes, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's, kidney disease, lung infections. So that kind of results in poor aging. This is what this is what it looks like. We we all have probably seen people like this. So what are we supposed to do? Mainstream medicine is around treating symptoms and fixing the problem with a with a chemical, but not really fixing the the root cause. The underlying cause of high blood pressure or diabetes is generally ignored in regular medicine. Instead, there's a pill to reduce the blood pressure. There's a pill to reduce the uh, blood sugar. But the underlying cause is still active, it's still going on. So we've only changed the symptom, but not the underlying cause. One of the best parts about this practice and the last 10 years of cytogenics has been able, has, has been the ability to take people off of their medications and treat the underlying cause. So hopefully no one's taking uh, this many pills. Of course, there's a place for medicines, right? Significant infections, cancer, you still need blood pressure medications if you need it, but it generally is a duct tape to a broken system. If we can treat the underlying cause, the body can heal itself. And that's what's really exciting. Uh, what I've learned in the last decade of doing this is the body is amazing. We've, as a species, have adapted for hundreds of thousands of years with changing environments. We've had ice ages, plagues, flus, rapid shifts to the climate, changes in the food supply. The, the DNA adapts we can definitely survive, but if we give our body what it needs, it will do a better job of it. Uh, so that's some of the things that you know we're starting to understand. Whereas we thought our genes were fixed, now we know that the D the DNA has these epigenetic changes, meaning uh, genes turn on and off depending on the environmental uh, situation, and that can have an imprint that actually goes through a few generations. But again. If we're able to uh, sort of provide our body with a great environment, it's going to do as much as it can to be as healthy as it can because it's survival of the fittest. If, it, if the body's under chronic stress and doesn't have what it needs to survive, it's, it's gonna do the bare minimum to just survive, but it may not build uh, the best body. You know, sort of like if, um, you know, if you had like, you know, a couple types of wood and uh, two tools, you might make a table and it's a functional table, maybe not the prettiest, but if you had 10 tools and some kind of exotic mahogany and plenty of time, you're, you know, you could make a beautiful table that's functional and beautiful and sturdy. So it's sort of a, so, so sort of like the body will do more if it has more, if that makes sense. It can prioritize how it uses resources. So again, the body is built to report, uh, repair itself. It, it knows what it's doing. We just have to give it the right nutritional support, the right physical uh, stimulus, 
and we have to give the body uh, the rest needs to repair. And again, that's going to be stress, sleep, fasting actually helps uh, quite a bit in allowing the body to repair itself. I, th uh, I think I covered this. You know, the body's going to work on fixing the most immediate needs first, and if it has extra resources, it'll do a better job. So how do we do that? We want to change the environment that our body's in, right? So we can change the body. So our approach is age management medicine. Again, Cytogenics uh, started this field about 22 years ago. There's a whole uh, specialty called age management medicine now. Uh, there's lectures and, and uh, uh, seminars that go on twice a year around it. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. So again, if you could uh, reduce or eliminate your medications, have better energy, have strength, power, or when I say power, I sort of mean even just sort of functional ability, going up and down stairs easily, uh, bending over easily, uh, you know, just carrying a box or groceries in, you know, that, that's important stuff. Uh, improved memory, focus, drive, and ambition. You know, memory is, a, is kind of a big deal. I mean, I think, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, I think most people are very afraid of uh, of losing their their memory and their ability to have cognition because, uh, you know, it's a, it's such a burden uh, uh, on family members and friends, but it's also just personally uh very, very scary. You know, the good news with, with uh, memory is reducing inflammation in the body, providing the right nutrients can help support the neurons in the brain. It can help uh, uh, reduce the inflammation that causes the, uh, the neurofibrillatory triangles that cause Alzheimer's. So kind of an important piece, uh, I think for most of us as we get older. You know, even as I've gotten older, sleep has not been as good as it uh, used to be, but uh, sleep is a big deal. And then again, relationships with your uh, f friends and family. And when I say that is when you feel better about yourself and you're doing well, uh, you're, you're essentially not as crabby. I mean, you're not as, uh, you know, you're not irritable. You, you, you enjoy life and you're you're happy to be part, in, part of life and engage. Uh, that's one of the interesting things I've found in, in my practice is you know, many, many spouses will say, wow, ever since uh, so-and-so became part of your program, he's just much more, or she's much more pleasant to be around. They're happier. Uh, our relationship is significantly better than it used to be. We're doing more things together. You know, it's not, it's not something you, you would necessarily think about on the face of it, but it is definitely one of the surprising uh, sort of side effects of, of taking care of your health. So here's some of the levers. Uh, oh, but before I do that, here's normal versus optimal. So I talked about what does normal versus optimal health mean? What's abnormal versus optimal? What's uh, failure versus being uh, the best? So the first part of it is, you know, knowing where your body's at. With Senogenics, we do a very comprehensive blood panel, we're looking at all the organ systems, we're looking at inflammatory systems, we're looking at metabolic processes, and with that, we get an idea of what your body's doing. It's, you know, sort of like, um, you know, if you were just to look at the Dow Jones on any given day, maybe it tells you a bit about how the economy is doing, but it's not going to give you the information that you might have if you have the Dow Jones, housing starts, consumer confidence, inflation rates, you know, whatever the economic markets are. But when you have more information, you have a better idea of what's going on underneath. Most medicine will just look at maybe the Dow Jones and say you're good or bad. You know, we're, we're looking a lot deeper at every sort of organ system and trying to get a better understanding of what's going on underneath so that we can make a, a change or an influence on that particular outcome. So look, some things you can check yourself are your weight, your blood pressure, you can check your waist and hip ratio, pant size, dress size, what's your exercise capacity? Are you able to uh, climb a few flights of stairs? Are you able to run one or two miles? Uh, do you get winded or not? You know, that, you know, those are some basic things all of us can check and, and, and get an idea of where we're at. And there's things to do, even if that's all you do. Do you have issues with sleep? Are you waking up refreshed? Or do you wake up and need definitely need a cup of coffee to get going? Do you feel like you have to uh, push through the day? Do you have trouble at night falling asleep? Do you have racing thoughts at night? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and not be able to fall asleep? You know, these are some symptoms that many people have. 
uh, energy again, just sort of dragging through the day. Pain, rashes, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about you know, autoimmune conditions, but uh, rashes uh, are, are pretty common in, in people. Uh, and then the, just digestion problems. Uh, how, how are you digesting food? Do you get bloated easily? Do you have reflux disease? Uh, do you have normal bowel uh, movements? Again, these are things that uh, we want to think about and can be uh, corrected. But the physical symptoms definitely lag behind the labs. So the blood analysis gives us a better picture. That's why we do labs uh, four times a year with our patients. We start with a complete panel. Uh, when patients are on the program with us, we do them every uh, every three months. Uh, my particular way of doing the labs is I want to educate the patient on every number that's important, why it's important, uh, what what's to be done about it, because I want you know the patient to be in, uh, educated, in charge, and empowered about their own biochemical blueprint, so that they know what they're doing and why they're doing it. So. The blood work is uh, very important. We'll see. This is, uh, I'm sure many of you have gone to your doctor and they said, you know, you might complain about a, a few symptoms here or there, but they'll say, oh, you know, everything looks normal. You're in the quote unquote normal range and uh, we'll see you uh, next year. What does real normal really mean? You know, normal means that you're within two standard deviations of the general population. So it's sort of like saying um, everyone who passes with a D minus all the way to an A plus is in the same category as normal. But as you guys know, passing with an A plus is very different than passing with a D minus. So we like to have more data. So the idea here is, you know, the more data you have, the better picture you're going to get, the more resolution you get with what's going on in the body. You know, again, if you're uh, at the top of the water, you see a shark fin, you think there's one shark here, there's a, a ton of them down there. So again, we, we, we try to look deeper and, and uh, get a real idea of what's going on. This is the standard deviation piece I was talking about in the upper left, uh, upper right corner here. Again, the uh, little car is just a diagram of regular medicine waiting for the car to break uh, before they're gonna do anything. So here's an example, vitamin D, less than 20 is deficient, 20 to 29 is insufficient. And that's, in, you know, that's what's required to prevent rickets or soft bones. But we know that levels of 50 to 80 are significantly better for your body. It's gonna boost the immune system, it's gonna fight cancer cells, it's gonna fight infections. So we like to get those levels up there. Uh, blood sugar and diabetes is a big concern for uh, many people. It's, it's probably one of the biggest uh, uh, ailments for all of society in America right now. Greater than 126 is diabetes. 100 to 125 is pre-diabetes. Less than 100 is normal. But we like to have our levels of uh, fasting blood sugar less than 86 because we know levels in the 90s are associated with increased risk of dementia. Levels in the 70s, 80s, 90s are associated with uh, increased heart disease. The higher, the higher you go with the blood sugar, the more heart disease there is. So again, we, we're, we're trying to look for that optimal level and 86 is currently what we think is the, uh, uh, the best place to be. No, 10 years ago, it was actually less than 95. So we've uh, downwardly adjusted that uh, because we, based on the research. Hemoglobin A1C also, a uh, measure of blood sugar and prediabetes. It's looking at a three to four month window of how high your sugars have been. Now, most doctors are probably not checking hemoglobin A1C. All I do, I, I, see, I see it more and more. It's not a screening tool for diabetes. We use it for diabetes to see if people are, uh, how diabetic they are. But, you know, again, 5.7 to 6.4 is an increased risk of diabetes. Greater than 6.5 is diabetes. But we want to see it at 5.1 or lower. That's where optimal is. That's where we know the sugars are not affecting the function of the cell. Of, of the cell. We know that there's less uh, glycation and aging of the, the human tissue and the bodies, and the cells are working optimally. So, again, a, a very significant difference. If you went to a, a, maybe a traditional medicine doctor and they saw a 5.5 or a 5.6, they'll say, yeah, yeah, you're fine. Don't worry about it. 
you know, and again, that's not risk for diabetes, but it's not optimal health. It's not gonna reduce your risk of aging. It's not gonna reduce, reduce your risk of dementia and uh, other ailments with chronic disease. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we look at these numbers in a different way. Uh, again, here, sort of in the same uh, diabetes uh, and uh, uh, metabolic syndrome standpoint, insulin greater than 20 is where uh, it's diabetes. Somewhere in the teens is gonna be insulin resistance. Uh, your regular doctor is not going to tell you that you have a problem until you get over 20, but we know that less than five is optimal. Insulin is, you know, the more insulin that's in your body, the more you're going to put on fat, the more it's going to affect other hormones like growth hormone and cortisol. Uh, so if we can get the insulin down, we're going to have better health and longevity overall. So again, routine medical screening misses things. So our approach is, well, here, finally, the secrets. Diet and nutrition, exercise, uh, nutrient supplementation. Again, I kind of mentioned earlier, the food supply isn't as uh, vital or it doesn't have as many nutrients as it used to have uh, back when we were picking our fruits and vegetables from the field the day they were ripe. You know, now with modern agriculture, we're able to feed billions of people on earth but generally the food is picked, you know, three or four weeks before it's fully mature. It's on a ship for, you know, two or three weeks, you know, and then finally gets to the uh, supermarket. You know, the, that, that same, that food doesn't have the same nutritional value that we might have evolved with. Again, on the other hand, we're, we have a lot of it we're, and, and more people are fed. So you know, I'm not complaining about how, you know, the, uh, the fact that we have great food supply, but we do have to supplement our uh, our diets with uh, with nutrients and again uh sort of like the idea with the vitamin d or or any of the other uh, uh nutrients that our body needs the more you have if the body has a full palette of colors to work with if it has a full toolbox the better job it can do at maintaining a healthier body one of my favorite sort of pet peeves is uh if you go to a regular doctor and i used to be this guy 15 20 years ago you know, should I take a multivitamin? Oh, no, you know, if you, uh, if you eat a good diet, you know, you'll get everything you need from your diet. Well, you know, who eats a great diet all the time, first of all? Secondly, you know, the, the, the idea of like you're going to take some supplements and uh, waste your money because you're making expensive urine. I'd still rather have a, a tank that's topped off and, you know, discard what I don't need versus being in a half-empty tank and not having the best health I can possibly have. Uh, definitely come around on this subject uh, in the last uh, 10 years myself. Hormone management is uh, what we are very, very uh, specialized and excellent in. Uh, hormones are important for our longevity. Uh, there's, there's great studies about longevity and reduced risk of cancer, reduced risk of diabetes, reduced risk of cardiovascular disease with optimal hormone levels. And that's something that we, we are particularly, particularly good at. So with diet and nutrition, Here's just a, a little slide I made. You know, you wanna to try to eat natural whole foods versus processed foods. Think about how the food supply might've been 100 or 150 years ago and how your body would've got it. The, the closer it is to the farm, the closer it is to fresh, the better it's gonna be for your body. And I think that's sort of evolutionarily uh, based. The macro balance, you know, there's fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. We in this society got really with the food pyramid uh, got trained to believe that lots of cereals and grains and carbohydrates were great for us but it turns out that most of that's just led to more diabetes and more heart disease uh, as we evolved as a species, we probably had more access to the hunter gatherer type lifestyle so that would be animal meats and proteins and uh, berries and nuts and seeds not fields of wheat uh, that turned into delicious loaves of Italian bread. Good fats and bad fats. There's a difference there. So maybe many of you heard of uh, the good fat, bad fat thing. You know, we used to think about saturated fat versus trans fat. That's that's part of it. But there's omega-3 fatty acids, which are very healthy, and omega-6, which we need. They're inflammatory, but the balance has been off based on how the food supply has been raised. So most of us are trying to raise our omega-3 fatty acids that's generally with fish oil or, uh, or grass-fed beef you know, uh, versus 
corn-fed beef, which is higher than the omega-6s. Micronutrient balance, there I'm talking about just getting a lot of greens in and a lot of uh, vegetables and fruits in general. Uh, we don't get as much of that as we used to. Uh, then organic or not, you know, there are, there are certain foods that are heavier in pesticides and herbicides uh, than others, but that can affect our hormonal systems. Uh, so it's, it's worth you know, thinking about those things. Exercise, cardio, high intensity interval training has a significant difference in the outcome of your health versus aerobic. So aerobic, think about like sort of like your 30 minutes, three times a week that we've been told to do for a long time and kind of getting it in your aerobic zone versus high intensity, which is more about sprints. Now, if you think about a marathon, you'll see somebody running 26.2 miles and they're overweight, heavy, they finished 26 miles and they trained all summer. Why are they not thin and skinnier versus you look at, a, or if you look at even in the Olympics, the, uh, the marathoners are, are fairly thin and uh, they, they look like a, a strong gust of wind could maybe blow them over. You look at the sprinters, they're running 30 seconds, 60 seconds at a time, but they've got muscles everywhere. They're, they're like Greek statues. So the type of exercise you do, getting that higher heart rate, engaging a different metabolic system makes a huge difference in the outcome of your health. Resistance training is big. Uh, I think a lot of people, almost everyone's talking now about how weight training is one of the, resistance training or weightlifting is one of the best things you can do as you get older for longevity. And then flexibility, you know, uh, is something that people don't think as much about, but flexibility is something to think, be thinking about. I will say that uh, for those of you who are golfers, the Pilates, if you do the Pilates, it takes a little while to get good at it, but it adds about 10 or 15 yards to the drive. Just from the flexibility of the pelvis. So to take that home if you're a golfer. Let's see what I did here. So nutrient supplementation. I think my slide just stopped for some reason. Sorry guys, I'm not sure what happened to my uh, deck here. So yeah, the nutrient supplementation, I was just saying, you know, you have the you have your basic needs like helping your bones stay strong. Optimal opportunity is fighting cancer, boosting your immune system. Hormone management, again, medical optimization to ideal values, not just the normal range. Huge difference between being on the lower end versus the higher end. Uh, there's been several studies done. Uh, a neat study done at the VA, it was a small study, but uh, they gave half of the, of the people in the study placebo and the other half testosterone. And the half that got testosterone after five years had a 10% all-cause mortality. The group that got the placebo, meaning no testosterone, had a 20% mortality after five years. So, you know, somebody said, if you take this pill or supplement and your 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 uh, risk of dying is decreased by 50%, would you take it? I'd say most people say yes. So you know, we focus on symptoms, not just numbers, they're guidelines. Uh, but here are some of the things we think about: testosterone, thyroid, cortisol. That's sort of the adrenal fatigue. Most of uh, most people who live today have some level of chronic stress. Uh, insulin, estrogen, progesterone. Testing is the uh, last piece. You know, we have the four pillars, but we test and we test four times a year. We make adjustments on an ongoing basis. Sort of, I don't like a regular medical practice where you uh, go in and you talk to your doctor. They give you some advice and some uh, recommendations, and you see them six months later or a year later, our practice is continuous management. We do the testing four times a year. So we're at least making an adjustment that often, but generally we're in constant communication with the patient around all of these pillars so that we can make adjustments throughout the year so that we can get the best results. I think that's one of the reasons why we're, you know, we get phenomenal results with our patients. So again, we take a sort of a full court press. All right, finally, the end of the slide deck. Sorry if that took too long. Um, we can open that up to uh, any questions that people may have. Hi, everyone. If you have a question for Dr. Patel, please go ahead and type it in the question section. You'll see uh, a question section there available to go ahead and answer, ask your question, and we'll get it to uh, Dr. Patel to answer. Hi, Dr. Patel. Our first question is going to be, uh, how do you work in conjunction with my current doctor and doctors uh, 
uh, and any medications that I'm currently on? So that's a really great question. So, I've, you know, we, we definitely have many, uh, I mean, almost every, obviously every patient is going to have a, a primary. You know what, what ends up happening, we, we've, we work in a consultative uh, fashion and our, our goal is to educate the patient and help manage them. You still want to have your primary care point person for times where you need to get in the hospital or, or deal with something acute. Having said that, I'm probably going to know you better than your doctor is going to know you. I mean, the office visit with me is going to be usually an hour and a half to two hours. We're going to go through everything. We're going to be talking a lot throughout the year. So ultimately, you know, I'm able to manage uh, medicines. Hopefully we're getting people off medicines. Most doctors that we, that I that I work with who are, you know, the, the patient's doctor are thrilled with the results that they're getting. And more intrigued about what what kind of medicine we're doing so generally that's not a problem now if the, you know if somebody's just better at blood pressure than me or you have a cardiologist that's better than than i am with blood pressure and you still have it of course you're going to work with them but usually with the education that i provide to the patient they go to their primary doctor or their cardiologist or whoever the specialist is i've seen that the their doctors will generally take them or reduce the medications or reduce uh, or take them off of it so that that works pretty well. That's pretty easy to do, and I have no problem you know talking with the other physician. Now I would say you know ten years ago, the doctors weren't didn't know as much about this kind of medicine, and they were a little bit more uh, skeptical. But in nowadays, you know they're all on board. Especially you know the American College of Cardiology has released a, a, a position statement on testosterone therapy and found it to be largely beneficial. They they found reduced mortality. And men who are on testosterone, you know, when you're getting off of diabetes medication, you know, and you're losing weight, looking good, and looking healthier, you know, the, the primary cares are uh, really on board. Great. Thank you for that answer. Uh, another question we have is how soon do patients see results? So, really quickly, I mean, usually um, within, a, you know, a month or two, they're, for men, they're going to generally lose a, a, a pant size or two within a month or two if they're following the recommendations around the diet and the exercise. Uh, energy will go up quickly. Uh, libido goes up quickly. Mental focus and ambition goes up quickly. Over So that so that's pretty quick for men. For, for women, it's also, it can be quick. It's between two and six months for women. Sometimes it takes, it takes almost six months to dial women in. But once they're dialed in, I mean, they're super happy. But, you know, it can if we're if we're fortunate it's two months for women, maybe up to six before it's really dialed in. For men it's I would say uh, you know, three to three three weeks to six weeks, they're gonna be definitely noticing a difference. I think I'm gonna just expound on that answer a little bit. Because we're working on everything that we find, it's gonna be across multiple planes of symptoms, meaning, you know, Obviously, energy and you know, strength and all that's sort of our, our core of what we do. But if somebody has uh, inflammation or they have gut issues or some other kind of unusual thing, we're covering that too. So, you know, a lot of times we're, we're going to be like putting on good probiotics or some type of cleanse that's going to heal the gut and that's going to make the bloating better. They're going to feel better throughout the day. They can start eating foods again that they couldn't eat before without without issue. So there's there's multiple symptoms that are going to improve uh, beyond just sort of our the core stuff that we're able to talk, you know, that we talk about on the website or whatever. Okay, great. Uh, another question, uh, are the blood panels at Synogenics more comprehensive than uh, traditional blood panels at primary care providers? Yeah, oh yeah, like, like way deeper and way broader. So in the presentation earlier where I talked about glucose, insulin, and hemoglobin A1C, usually a primary care physician will just look at the glucose, but every test we're going to do the a the hemoglobin A1C, which is the three to four month uh, average of how high the blood sugars are. We do that every time. We check the insulin numbers every time. Uh, we're checking inflammatory markers, liver enzymes, kidney function, uh, all the hormones, so I think it's like 96 different numbers that we have, some, something like that. But it's, it's across all the organ systems. And, and again, it's not just um, looking for the absence of uh, disease. It's looking for what's the optimal levels on those numbers as well. 
And uh, and finally, you know, for for me, my my style of practice is to really go over all of those numbers and educate the patient around what those numbers mean, so that they know how to uh, how to analyze their own blood work and, and take charge of their own health. Because you know, if I win the lottery, I might have to go to Mexico because my wife will make me. Or if somebody, you know, there, anything could happen where we, we're going to have a relationship in five years, but I don't want a patient to not uh, know how to uh, analyze their own numbers. Great. Another uh, question coming in. How is Synogenics different than a low T center? So that's a really good question. So obviously low T centers have uh, really, uh, you know, become prominent over the last five to seven years. Kind of like I said earlier, 10 years ago, people were really afraid of testosterone. About five or seven years ago, testosterone clinics have uh, taken off. There's a big difference in what we do. Uh, so a low T center will uh, check only the testosterone and a couple of other numbers. If you're low enough by the number, they'll give you some testosterone. But if you're not low enough, they probably will not treat you. And they certainly won't treat you to optimal numbers. And generally, it's going to be a, a physician's assistant or or someone like that who's just sort of seeing a, a, a number of patients a day. There's not a, a much nuance. You know, when when I'm dealing with a patient and they're on hormone replacement therapy, you know, we're look. It's not just the numbers; it's the symptoms. How are you feeling? How long do you feel well? Are you having any side effects? You know, the the numbers are good guidelines, but th that's not the whole patient. And you and you see this with uh, thyroid management and some of the other hormone management. You know, some some people do well with a testosterone level, a uh, free testosterone level of you know 180. Other people need to be at 240 for them to get the same benefit, and that's because of testosterone receptor variations and uh, metabolism differences in how fast you're breaking down the, the testosterone injection uh, the molecule that we provide. So it, it's a lot more nuanced. We're we're treating to optimal levels, not just trying to get you uh, a little higher. And we're also going to treat someone who may be in the normal range, but suffering from symptoms of low testosterone. I don't think a low T center will do that. They, you have to be absolutely low uh, if they're going to treat you. But again, it, it's sort of like a very uh, a cookie cutter protocol based uh, system. The other piece is we're not just in testosterone. I mean, I know we've talked about it, but it's really the lifestyle and nutrition. You know, my exercise nutritional uh, counselor, Nate, is outstanding. He he spends a lot of time with our patients. We customize our exercise routines, our uh, nutrition uh, uh, programs, so that it works for the patient and gets the best results. So that continuous ongoing management, and then the approach to the all of the uh, all the systems of the body, not just the testosterone, is why we get superior results. Great. Um, another question: um, At what age does Synogenics start treating patients? So. I would say, you know, surprisingly, my, my youngest patient actually is about 31 uh, when they started, but most people are so, sort of in the late 30s, early 40s when they start. Uh, we've had some patients who start as late as 77 years old. I think we had a patient about two weeks ago who started uh, at 77. So it's, it's um, again, because it's an overall lifestyle and health program, almost any age uh, can benefit. but Certainly with, with people who are younger, you know, we're going to take a, a, a cautious approach with uh, the hormones, but I would definitely have patients started at, at 31. They needed some of the nutritional help. They needed some of the uh, physical help. They still needed some testosterone. Interestingly enough, with, um, you know, with, with some of the younger people, I think because of all the environmental sort of influences, the hormone systems have really been affected. The... Uh, you know, the, the fertility rate has gone down year over year for the last 45 years or so. Testosterone levels have dipped for the last 45 years or so. So I'm seeing a lot of younger people who have hormonal issues younger than, uh, than some of my older patients. If you type in uh, endocrine uh, disrupting agents in Google, you'll see like a, just tons of uh, lists of, of items that affect our hormonal balance. Um, another question is, um, how big of a role does genetics play into the diseases we experience as we age, and what does Synogenics do to combat genetic-related uh, issues? So 
genetics do have a part to play. One of the things that's coming to be evident uh, is that there's genes, but whether they're active or not, and whether or not they're impacting your outcome and your, and your health varies from person to person. So the environment can, can turn genes on or off. And this is why, you know, when you see even like lung cancer, 30% of people who have lung cancer never smoked. Some people have genes for lung cancer, they don't get it. Other people don't have the genes for lung cancer and they get it. Uh, so the genes are important. Now, where, where we see the genes making a difference, a lot of times is in metabolic processes like methylation. So there's some genes that affect how your body processes some amino acids and that can affect certain levels of neurotransmitters in the body. And so we will work on those. We do have a complete genetic test. It's a whole exome test where we check, it checks the whole genome for everything. It's way beyond like a 23andMe. And that, that test can indicate, you know, your risk for all kinds of potential ailments. And so I don't know how many, how, how many people do it, but it's, it's, a, it's a really good test for people who want to know. So we, we do have the genetic testing for those who want to know. In my practice, uh, again, I'll probably work more on the lifestyle and if there's still something that is uh, missing or we need to figure out and all our traditional or, or uh, first efforts don't work, then hey, let's look at the genes and see what we're dealing with and then adapt the therapy at that point. Uh, it's probably not like a first throw for me. It'll probably be you know, later down the line if, if we're still struggling. But we do offer complete genetic testing like way beyond, I think, almost anyone in the country. Great. Another question here. Um, why am I told I have low T when my primary care physician uh, says I'm within normal limits? Yeah, so the normal range for total testosterone is anywhere between 250 to 1,100. So if you fall anywhere between that range, they'll just say you're normal. Again, that doesn't mean you're optimal. That means that, hey, you're normal in the sense that you're going to pass from fourth grade to fifth grade with a C minus, but you're not going to get there with an A. The other piece is, uh, unfortunately, medicine has gotten to the point where uh, we've decided to look at numbers and not at symptoms. So both with thyroid and testosterone, you can have all the symptoms of either low thyroid or low testosterone, but the numbers don't fall far enough out of the uh, out of the reference range that they'll treat you. Uh, again, it's sort of like waiting for the car to break. You know, if you had a car and the, the tires were getting wobbly and, and uh, the tread was getting thin, you'd be kind of like, well, you know, uh, you know, it's still normal, it's functional, so we're going to leave it. We're going to wait for the tire to blow and the car to get in the rack, and then we'll treat it. So that's kind of regular medicine. So the other the other piece is as I mentioned a bit earlier, is the right level of testosterone, in my opinion, varies uh, from person to person. There's, you know, testosterone is just the number of, it's, it's a level of testosterone in the bloodstream, but it doesn't tell you about how well the testosterone molecule itself binds to the receptor on the cell and how well that signal goes to the inside of the cell to then actually tell the cell to do something. So there's all these points of variability that are beyond just the level of testosterone in the bloodstream. So great guideline, we use it, but it's really about, you know, the symptoms and how is the patient doing and how do we optimize that. Great. Another question here about sleep. I have a general question regarding my sleep. I don't sleep well, restlessness, racing thoughts, and just wake up completely exhausted. Uh, can Cynogenic help with this? Yeah, so that sounds like a number of our patients. Uh, you know, one thing one thing I've had I've learned to do in this practice. So you know, beyond the nutritional lifestyle things we do, we do we do focus a bit on the sleep. But one thing that's really become prevalent is something called uh, adrenal fatigue. So you know, we there's a adrenal fatigue happens when you've had chronic stress for three to five years or more, and the cortisol levels initially as a stress hormone increase in response to stress. But after three or four years or five years, the adrenal glands burn out and then the body just doesn't produce the amount of cortisol it needs. So cortisol should be the highest in the uh, morning and lowest in the evening. And as you sleep overnight, your body makes more cortisol and you sort of wake up with a full tank and use it through the day. But if your adrenal glands are fatigued, you don't wake up with enough cortisol 
And so you wake up sort of, a, a, you know, definitely needing a cup of coffee, not feeling refreshed, feeling like you have to push your uh, push yourself through the day, having an afternoon fatigue. And then at night, your body, when, it, when the cortisol should be low, it's your body's still trying to make up for the earlier needs. So you have this relatively high level at night when you're, when you're trying to go to sleep. And then, then you have racing thoughts, carb cravings, difficulty falling asleep, maybe feeling a bit jittery. Um, you might wake up in the middle of the night and uh, and not be able to go back to sleep. So that's sort of like this abnormal cortisol curve. It, it's not following the, the natural pattern. So that is something that uh, that we do work on. It's a harder thing to treat, but you know it. it it's, well, when we do, when we're, when we're successful, which is you know most of the time we are. So, you know, some people. If they can't change their lifestyle, if they're not going to stop, you know, flying to Europe for one-hour meetings because they're an investment banker, it's hard to change the, you know, fix the cortisol. But for other people who we 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 can manage their lifestyle a bit and get them on the right supplements, all of a sudden they're sleeping through the night, they're waking up uh, refreshed, they're getting through the day, uh, and and they just feel better. And that's an important one. The other hormones in the body don't work as well if the cortisol curve and the adrenal glands aren't working well. So that's, uh, that's an important one, and we definitely spend a lot of time on that. Great. So I think we have time just for one more question. Uh, how often would I need to come in to, for an appointment uh, if I signed up for Cynogenics? And also, how long would I have to be on the program? Well, oh, that's, a, that's a nice question. So you know, what, one, of the, one of the really cool things about Cynogenics is you know, when they started 22, 23 years ago, I mean, it was the first of its kind. They started in Las Vegas. And, you know, of course, you know, so people would fly to Las Vegas and they would come for the initial office visit. But to ask someone to come to Las Vegas four times a year or any destination would be onerous. So uh, we have a nationwide uh, phlebotomy network that draws the patient's blood from anywhere. Future consults are all essentially telemedicine. I mean, they're phone consults. You know, anyone who wants to come back in for a repeat testing for like a repeat body scan or repeat uh, exercise testing, I mean, they're certainly welcome to. But I'd say most of my patients, it's gonna be phone-based conversation, very relationship-based as well, because we're gonna get to know each other quite a bit. But the actual need to come in the office is just the initial visit. We like to see people come back uh, once a year for an annual visit, but the ongoing management is really uh, remote and, and uh, phone-based and again, relationship-based. Great, thank you. Okay, so if that's, those are all, that's, that's what we have time for. So, but hey, it was, uh, it was really great for me. It was fun for me to, uh, to talk to all of you. Obviously, anyone who was on this call is a uh, friend or a family member of one of my patients. So the idea that I had was just, you know, let me just talk to people that are interested, that are friends and family. So hopefully everyone got a bit out of this uh this little presentation and i and I, you know if, if anyone wants to come on board that'd be great i'd love to have you but hopefully you, you got something out of it uh, either way and it was it was really fun for me because if, at least because i know you're a, uh, one of my patient's friends it's a little bit more personal for me so thank you guys for taking the time to to get online and, and spend some time with me today